What is the biggest challenge facing U.S. K through 12 public education? Preparing children instead of sorting them. Preparing children for a fulfilling, independent, and productive life as a citizen. We are transitioning from a uh, uh, industrial economy to a knowledge economy, and that's been going on for a while. The problem is that today's dominant school model, which is widely described as the industrial or factory model, no longer meets the country's needs. It was literally built for another era and another economy. Fundamentally, we just have a system mismatched for the times and the challenges that we face and the extreme personalization in learning and supports that our students need. Students do not have access to enough excellent schools that unleash their full potential or the right kinds of educational opportunities that prepare them to lead in large and small ways in an increasingly interconnected global world. To me, the continued belief that a one-size school fits all learners and that at the secondary level, the belief that a school then work path is the best way to serve uh, young adults. The inability of the system to flex, to pivot, to advance, and to innovate is the biggest threat to children's educations across this nation. Our biggest challenge right now is the political nature of our education system, one that often places the needs of adults ahead of the needs of families. This problem is even more pronounced in inner city settings, where school district leadership is unstable and elected school boards are more beholden to the special interest groups that have put them in office rather than the families they serve. We know that the number one school level factor uh, for our student success is that of the classroom teacher. And we also know that we are facing critical teacher shortages across our nation. This stems from a decline in the people entering the profession, um, but it's also in the number of highly trained teachers who are leaving the profession. Today, we have poor quality teacher preparation an equally low quality leadership training with untrained adults supervising clinical training that usually lasts but a single semester. I think schools have traditionally had a little bit of a kind of arm's length relationship to the community and to parents. Um, I think that's got to change. COVID-19 has presented many challenges to our schools. Um, and I think that the country has done a very poor job of dealing with disruption. Uh, COVID-19 has uh, forced us to move away from many of the routines, and it has also impacted the relationships that our students, uh, our parents and families, and our teachers have with one another. And I think uh, the impact of that is going to be with us for some time. The pandemic has created a crisis for students, especially our youngest children in the highest need schools who require extra support to succeed. School closures failed children all across our nation. And now we know that they took a disproportionate toll on minority and low income students. Assessment data show that white students, especially in higher income communities, meet or exceed grade level expectations at a rate that is often twice that of lower income students of color. It begins with unequal school funding, uh, which is layered on. Uh, unequal access to resources for families, high poverty rates, uh, high rates of homelessness, food insecurity, housing insecurity, uh, and that also then leads to the disparate uh, allocation of qualified teachers who are needed to help students actually make the connection between what they know and what they bring and what we want them to learn. So the gap between high performance and low performance is large and it's growing. Many of the reforms that have been implemented in the last 40 years or so have in fact helped some individual students' outcomes. But overall, there have not been significant improvements in closing the gaps. I believe the biggest challenge facing US K-12 public education is that of equity. More specifically, the quality of one's education whether it's elementary, middle, or high school, is highly dependent on a zip code, 
or a specific area within a zip code. This has been the case for generations, and unfortunately, it continues to be the case uh, today with even growing degrees of inequity on the other side of the COVID-19 pandemic and school shutdowns that plagued many of our nation's school systems. We have tried many things over these years to address these, this challenge, remedial programs in high poverty schools, higher standards, accountability for results, smaller classes, extended learning time, and charter schools, among others. But at the end of the day, over a long period of time, achievement is still too low compared with that in high-performing countries with whom we compete. The multi-decade obsession with closing achievement gaps by identity group has not worked. And what's worse is that not only did we not close the achievement gaps, we also haven't substantively increased overall achievement levels. First, whenever you hear someone refer to the racial achievement gap, they almost always mean the black-white achievement gap. This perpetuates a narrative of black failure and white superiority and establishes white student performance as the standard for comparison. Parents are frustrated with their educational options and are seeking more control over their child's education. And uh, we see this in terms of the 19 states that passed or expanded private school choice initiatives in 2021, and also the fact that public charter school waiting lists are at a record level. Parents want more school choice. What is one thing you would do to improve elementary and or secondary outcomes in the United States? Well, the best thing we can do to improve education outcomes is to create a system that empowers our parents. We can no longer be satisfied with an education system that only educates a select few. Every child can learn and every school can adapt to fit the needs of our students but we need to create a, cre create a greater sense of urgency and liberate our educators to educate our children and not allow bureaucracies to get in the way of their success. Step away from group identity, or at least recognize that the distance we care about is not the gap between one arbitrary identity group and another arbitrary identity group, it's the distance from where every student is today as an individual and 100% proficiency in their subject discipline. I would also like to see real parent empowerment and real parent advocacy welcomed. I see a lot of box checking and a lot of claimed engagement. Parents have a lot to say about their children's education and they're the most credible source of information when it comes to their children's education. I would focus primarily at the early childhood and elementary levels with programs that help with childcare after school and with services like tutoring for those who need it. I'd create a groundswell for the creation of more schooling options for high school youth. Sadly, throughout the pandemic, we've seen parents' voices silenced in the midst of school closures. And at the same time, We've seen support for school choice hit record high levels. I'm talking about 74% of African-American parents actually support school choice. 76% of Hispanic parents support school choice. That's 80% of working parents support school choice. School choice is a meta reform in that it simply aligns the incentives of the education system to motivate the actors in that system to continue and expand the approaches that are working for students and to stop engaging in the kinds of, of approaches and policies that aren't helping students and that parents object to. So the one thing I would do to improve the system is implement policies squarely aimed at increasing teacher capacity and insisting on teacher quality. Lasting change has to come at the school level, school by school. 
To that end, I think the most important single thing we can do to enable more effective execution and coherence at the school level is to develop a pipeline of well-trained, effective school leaders and empower them and their leadership teams to make decisions for their students. We need to build around core instruction with high caliber teacher preparation, curriculum-based PD for existing teachers, rigorous content-based assessments, and the national use of transparent, parent-friendly accountability. But take Massachusetts, which put in place a set of systemic reforms in the early 1990s that propelled the state to number one in the US rankings on the NAEP assessments and competitive with the high achieving countries in the world. Uh, what did they do? They improved teacher training along with subsidies for preparation, uh, equalized salaries that could eliminate teacher shortages. I think Eric Hanushek's work in this space has made clear that that's the single most important school-based factor for student achievement. And we all know the challenges of the system, this big, huge, complex system that is, um, you know, got all of these components and the state has a role, the districts have a role, and the schools have a role, and the higher eds have a role. It's just this big, disconnected, decentralized system that just isn't getting us the folks that we need in the classroom. Whether they're obstacles of poverty, obstacles of COVID-19, obstacles of uh, the lack of broadband access, all of those things that, that play into the success of our current and future education system, I believe can be overcome by the collective efficacy of teachers working together, collaboratively looking at their data, understanding the standards that we want our students and the things we want our students to know and be able to do. There remains untapped brilliance in our communities, particularly in communities of color and lower income communities. In small and large ways, we are seeing a groundswell of innovation and new demands from families and communities on schools. We need to create a culture where experimentation and innovation are welcome. If I have to name one thing, I'm going to call out the labor leaders who represent classroom teachers in elections and districts, the AFT, the NEA, and their affiliates. They aren't the only obstacles to innovation but they are probably the most potent one. At the very least, we need to allow teachers to opt out of funding the political activities of their labor leaders. We must focus on student engagement, igniting the passion for learning in each of our students. There's real joy in learning and there's real joy in a job well done. And I fear that our students are missing out on that. To improve education, let's help students see and understand the purpose of learning, help them discover their own unique gifts, ask questions, to set goals, and take charge of their own learning. Teaching skills that are necessary, required to be effective, have to be ramped up significantly. We have brain research today that helps to understand ways that children learn. We have data to ensure that we give strategies for deeper learning rather than just memorization. We have research today that identifies the different strategies helpful in teaching to differentiated learners. We need to move to a mastery-based learning system, a rigorous system in which students only move on when they've actually mastered the materials, can demonstrate that mastery in a rigorous way that has validity and reliability. We have spent hundreds of millions of dollars in reading instruction, we have brain science, we have cognitive science, we have behavioral science, we have empirical studies, all of which indicate the right way to teach reading. The problem is we're not doing it. And as a result, our students are not learning how to read. We must, we must implement the rigorous science behind reading uh, across the board. And this includes both ed schools and the K-12 public schools. I place my bet on helping schools implement coherent instructional programs. These must be built around rigorous and standards aligned knowledge based curriculum with tightly aligned and high quality instructional materials and strategies, interim and summative assessments, and data systems that inform continuous improvement. I believe that one of the primary things we need to do as policymakers is to make learning more relevant. 
clearly today, a number of our students, especially in secondary um, and in those high school settings, uh, either drop out or uh, don't actually find that secondary environment relevant to their education. How many times have we as parents and as leaders had kids ask, why am I learning this? Incorporate teaching important life skills into the curriculum. For example, listening, accountability, manners, gracious winning and losing, goal setting, habits of success. Schools can no longer um, afford the luxury of assuming these skills are taught elsewhere. We should expand, promote, and incentivize career and technical education in grades six through 12, offering more excellent choices, including earn and learn programs and early graduation for students pursuing associate degrees or trade certificates. No matter what uh, career you have, having integrated knowledge of new technologies and new technologies being used is going to be extremely important to be effective in our careers in the future. If we have been successful in creating dramatic change in public education 10 years from now, what will be different? If we're successful in making the right kinds of investments, all children will have high quality schools with the resources needed for learning. They will have a diverse and stable educator workforce who know how to support a learning process needed to achieve deep understanding of content and the ability to learn independently. I want to see the profession of teaching dramatically change. New teachers would now have gone through a difficult preparation program with a residency component and with a demonstration of essential skills that I've learned. They would work in a school where there's time to collaborate and there's time to spend communicating with parents. Public education will also be different because all students and families across the country will have full and unimpeded agency in accessing a wide array of excellent, innovative, and equitable educational opportunities that match their aspirations, interests, and needs. A lot of options, a lot of student agency, a lot of community and family engagement, a lot of different learning opportunities, a lot of different curricular resources. The way kids are organized for instruction is different. We've gotten rid of the Carnegie unit. Like we've done some, some really fundamental changes. A diverse and stable group of educators who know how to support a learning process that's needed to achieve deep understanding of content, as well as the ability to learn independently uh, because our kids are going to encounter knowledge that hasn't been discovered yet, using technologies that haven't been invented yet, solving major problems that we have not been able to solve. I would also like to see civic literacy valued as a part of the K-12 public education system. If we expect for citizens to understand the governance structure that governs them, civic literacy and engagement is a vital component of their education, of their knowledge building and their skills ability. If we're successful in transforming education, fundamentally the incentives in our system will have changed. We'll be funding not just time and seat or average daily attendance, but actual learning progress and gains. With the mastery of education, I believe that you will find more success and more students hit proficiency benchmarks and thereby having more success in opportunities post-secondary and beyond. I think we should be focused on consistent and hopefully accelerating progress, building on our successes and addressing our weaknesses, especially in communities that have been struggling for decades and were set back even further by COVID. We will have abandoned group identity as the most salient characteristic when reporting and evaluating student outcomes. We will have recognized that there are far more powerful individual factors that drive student achievement. Factors like hours spent studying, attendance, having access to a school of choice, growing up in a stable married to parent household. I often think it is time to shift K to 12 education from an age graded structure to a competency based approach. 
That would be a dramatic change, especially with parental and public expectations of what schools look like and how students experience it. The reality is we know that there is a strong correlation between education and crime rates, uh, between education and healthy communities. So when we are successful, uh, 10 years from now, I think we will see healthier communities and uh, we're all committed to, to making that happen. What would be different is that most parents will have a lot more choices among distinctive schools for their children to attend. Uh, I suspect many of them will have access to education savings accounts, so-called ESAs, where the state deposits a portion of the money that they would spend on the child in traditional public schools into a savings account controlled by parents that they can use to purchase a variety of education services. For example, when parents use public funds to send their children to their school of choice, the school must respond to their satisfaction or risk losing funds. Additionally, when parents commit to choosing a school or provider, they often own their decision and are more likely to be positively engaged in their child's success. By expanding school choice, we can ensure all kids have access to a quality public education and our nation will be better for it. All children will have agency over their education. They will view their schools and education as preparing them for life. The achievement gap will have been closed and every child will have an equal chance at reaching the American dream. That would then allow them to get jobs that are both meaningful to society and have great earning potential for themselves. As a result, we will see a substantially reduced income gap between those going to four-year colleges and the high number of students now graduating with professional credentials from post-secondary training. We will have higher literacy rates. We will have higher health indicators. We will have greater economic development, greater success of our students. We'll have more 26-year-olds with AAs, BAs, and meaningful certifications earning family-sustaining incomes. In short, more young adults are doing what they love and earning what they need and making an enormous contribution to their communities. What I would expect is the competencies of the American graduates from American public high schools would go up. Competencies across the board for reading, math, science. These are critical. But I would also like to see more attention paid to citizenship. Because not only do we need a productive workforce, we also need an active, engaged, and informed citizen. The United States, 10 years from now, will continue to lead the world in innovation, creativity, and problem solving. With the proof of our continued leadership evident with the innovation of U.S. companies and U.S. workers. Our companies and workers will be the most admired and most sought after in the world because of their creativity, expertise, and performance. We will have uh, a much happier, productive, wealthier economy and society that's going to be creating absolutely new ideas and new innovations that of course we can't even imagine today uh, for the future and for our future generations to come. <music>